I'm Carolyn Wright, Chair of the School Board of the City of Virginia Beach, and I hereby call this special meeting to order at 6.01 p.m. on this 20th day of, of January 2022. Pursuant to Bylaw 146 and Virginia Code 2.2-3707, at the call of the School Board Chair on request of the Superintendent of Schools and with the concurrence of the School Board Chair, the school board will hold a special meeting on Thursday, January 20th, 2022 at the school administration building number six at the municipal center 25. In progress. <laughs> That's reassuring. <laughs> 2512 George Mason Drive, Virginia Beach, Virginia at 6 p.m. The purpose of this special meeting is one, briefing from staff and legal counsel regarding the January 15th, 2022 Executive Order 2 and the implications and actions for the school board and the school division. Two, action by the school board as determined necessary. And three, consultation with legal counsel in closed session. Also, pursuant to the school board's 2021 2022 reopening plan adopted August 10th, 2021, and the school board vote on August 24th, 2021, regarding health protocols for school board meetings, it is determined that physical distancing will be used in school board chambers as a health mitigation strategy. Thus, we have designated public seating this morning in chambers, this evening, excuse me, in chambers during this meeting. Members of the public, as always, are able to observe the special school board meeting through live streaming on vbschools.com, broadcast on VBTV channel 47, and on Zoom. So with that, Madam Clerk, would you please uh, state attendance? Thank you, Madam Chair. Present in school board chambers are Chairwoman Rye, Ms. Melnick, Ms. Anderson, Ms. Felton, Ms. Franklin, Ms. Holtz, Ms. Hughes, Ms. Manning, Ms. Owens, Ms. Riggs, and Ms. Weems. Thank you. <clears throat> Next order of business is adoption of the agenda, and there is a slight, there is a modification regarding the numbering of the agenda items. The agenda numbers are not in sequence. Item number three, information and discussion, is correct. Correction beginning with item number four, closed session as needed. And then number five, motions by school board members. So you see here a number was skipped and that's why the sequence is a little off. Again, number five, motions by school board members to vote on any matters relevant to the special meeting. And then six becomes the summary of actions to be handled at a later date. And finally, seven, adjournment. So with that, are there any other modifications? Okay, okay, hearing none, motion to approve. Mrs. Manning, a second, Mrs. Anderson. All in favor, sh sh kindly show a raised hand. Madam Chair, we have unanimous vote. The motion to pass. Okay, thank you. So that leads us straight to the purpose of this evening, um, information and discussion. And we begin with Dr. Don Robertson, Chief of Staff.
just leave it here in case you need it. All right, well. It's on. Yes. All right. So, good evening, Chairwoman Rye, Vice Chair Melnick, members of the board, and Dr. Spence. As I am Don Robertson, the Chief of Staff. And tonight I wish to share all that has been happening since late afternoon on Saturday as a result of, and Miss, um, tonight, can you put the presentation up, please? Thank you. Uh, I'd like to share all that's been happening since late afternoon on Saturday as a result of Governor Yunkin's Executive Order Number 2. In addition, I'll share the administration's recommendation for a path forward. Please know we recognize and acknowledge the tremendous burden and pressure on each of you as you try to make a decision in the best interest of over 65,000 students, some 130,000 parents and guardians, and countless other guardians and siblings that reside in the homes of our students. No matter what you decide, know your school administration appreciates your work, the difficulty of this task, and we will provide you our full support. Late in the afternoon on Saturday, many of us became aware of Governor Yunkin's release of Executive Order Number 2. This order provides for a parent choice as to whether their child will wear a face covering when he or she attends school. On the surface and under normal conditions, this seems most appropriate. However, in this case, it represented the first time since March of 2020 that the governor, the Virginia Department of Health, the American Medical Association, and the CDC were not aligned in their position on health and safety mitigations. In this case, the governor's office has released an order that's in conflict with mandatory face coverings for all students when inside school buildings. As a result, Dr. Spence and his team immediately began to consider the ramifications of this order to our practices and overall school community. On Sunday, Dr. Spence convened his leadership team and we developed a message to go out that evening to our community, many of whom had already started to email us as well as board members expressing their opinions, whether they were for or against Executive Order 2. We also planned for a series of meetings to gather as much information as possible in advance of having to develop a plan for how to proceed on Monday, January 24th. Over the past four days, we have formally met with the Virginia Beach Department of Public Health three times and had other impromptu conversations as late as four o'clock today to ascertain their thinking on this issue. Ms. Linetti, legal counsel, Ms. Allen, chief communications and community engagement officer, and Dr. Spence spoke daily with colleagues from across the state as we began hearing of division responses and heard of potential legal actions against this order. I met daily with other chief officers and spoke to my colleagues in neighboring school divisions. And throughout these conversations, we have kept an open mind as we certainly recognize we have stakeholders on both sides of this issue. And we know the school division and the school board have been positioned squarely in the middle of this argument. Tonight, we come to you with a brief summary of the options we considered and our recommendation in advance of Executive Order 2 going into effect on Monday, January 24th. Here you will see the three options we considered in no particular order. Option A is to strictly follow Executive Order 2 and make masks optional for any child whose parent or guardian requests it. At the same time, other parents and students could continue to wear a face mask as they deem necessary. Option B is to follow the law. School Board, or I'm sorry, Senate Bill 1303 and the recommendations of the Virginia Department of Health and CDC and continue to enforce mandatory masking of all students when inside the school building. The only exceptions would be for those students who had an approved medical or religious exemption. In essence, we would be continuing to enforce our current mitigation plans. At the same time, we would also be monitoring the legal actions taken by other school divisions and how they may impact our mitigation strategies. Option C entailed the longest discussion as we considered how we could possibly accommodate the provisions of parental choice in Executive Order 2 
with the requirements in Senate Bill 1303 and recommendations of the Virginia Department of Health and CDC. In short, we wanted to find common ground as schools should not be used as a place to settle political disagreements. And we felt option A or option B would place stakeholders in opposite camps, leaving schools stuck in the middle. After much deliberation, we have a recommendation for the board to consider. Before sharing, I want to share how absolutely difficult this dilemma has been. We are well aware of how many of our stakeholders feel about this issue. Over the past week, we have received throngs of emails and calls on top of the same level of communication that has gone to board members. It will not be surprising to hear that we have heard support from many stakeholders for both option A, which is to execute executive order two as written, and option B, to stay the course with our current mass mandates. In short, this issue has placed us in the proverbial King Solomon dilemma, which mother gets the baby? Our role as educators is to teach our students how to face such dilemmas and do so in a manner that informs, provides clarity of purpose, understanding, and seeks to honor all parties in the decision-making process. As a result, neither option A or B met our goal. Therefore, we recommend option C, one that incorporates a piece of both law and the executive order. We will continue to adhere to Senate Bill 1303 and have universal masking in schools as part of our layered prevention strategy, while also acknowledging Executive Order 2, which allows parents to opt out of this requirement. This will mean that some students will be in school buildings without masks starting January 24th. All students who ride a bus must comply with federal order, which requires the wearing of a face covering while on the bus. Those parents who choose not to comply with this will need to transport their child to and from school. All staff must continue to wear a face covering when inside school buildings, as that is a dolly regulation. All visitors and spectators, including students that attend athletic events and after school programming must wear a face covering. Student quarantine will return to 10 days and high school students will no longer, will, will now be required to quarantine when identified as a close contact. We will survey families to ascertain interest in those who would like Virginia Beach to pursue an additional virtual option and we will work with the state to see how Virginia Beach City Public Schools can accommodate those families who request this option. It's important to note that a virtual option will be thoroughly explored, but may not be viable without significant support from the state. And of course, we will continue to monitor the legal challenges that are existing with executive order number two. We believe this approach best provides each stakeholder with a path forward, albeit not a perfect path, but one we can make work. At this time, Dr. Spence and his team are available to answer questions. Dr. Badati, our Virginia Beach Department of Public Health Director, is available online to answer any questions as well. Thank you, Dr. Robertson. We'll begin with Mrs. Anderson. I would like to add one more um, thing to, to what you just put up there, if you'll put those back up. Um, Obviously, when a student has to go to the nurse because they're feeling sick, that student should not be allowed to enter the clinic regardless of the, of the uh, executive order unless they put on a face mask. Um, and we can provide face masks outside the clinic. We need to respect the fact that if a child goes to the nurse and they're sick, for whatever reason, they need to have a mask on at that point in time. Absolutely. So I, would like, I would like to make sure that that's included as part of this mitigation. Absolutely. <clears throat> Colleagues? 
what, one more thing, parents, just add. Are we going to ask parents to write a note? We are not. Or is there some type of a, how do we know a student is actually, has parents' permission to be without a mask? How do we know that? The, we, we discussed the logistical challenges of requiring a, a physical note from every parent who wishes to opt their child out of our requirement, which would be that mandatory face covering. And we decided logistically that would be adding one more burden to the teacher's plates. And so uh, a child who shows up on Monday, if this is the plan that's implemented, uh, without a face covering will not receive any questions from anyone. I just, I, I do know for a fact that that was what my grandchildren had to do in Tampa. If they, if their parent wanted them to not have a mask on, they provided a form that was online uh, or a parent could just simply write a note that says, you know, my child is exempted and the child brought that into school or the parent could send it in. So, you know, I think I actually shared that with you back in August. Um, yes, ma'am, um, you did. But I would suggest that, you know, because th there will be kids who just say, well, I'm not wearing it, you know. And my mom didn't give me permission, but I'm not doing it. So, you know, this is, this is a parent choice, not a child's choice. Um, I feel like, you know, parents have been screaming, parent choice, parent choice. So I think this should be something that should, we should require. And I know it's a burden on the teachers to have to accept a note, but this is parent. This is a parent permission thing. So it's not a student permission thing. So that's just my suggestion. Thank you. Okay, Mrs. Hughes. So this, this is a parental choice issue, but one of the things we are also hearing from teachers consistently, and I agree with them, is that they're shuffling a lot of papers that are unnecessary. They have a lot of duplicative duties, and I just don't see the point in having this permission slip. I mean, parents send kids with lunch and they don't know if they're trading it or eating it. Kids have certain things they leave the house with in their pockets, and parents may or may not. I'm, I'm not saying they don't check, but, you know, things slip out all the time. And this is really a discussion to have between a parent and a child. And if the parent wants them to wear one and the child's not and the parent finds out, the parent can deal with that at home. I, I don't think that we need to send a bunch more permission slips and have more papers for teachers to keep track of. If I may offer something in between, per elementary teachers have one class basically. And, and because of the age of the children too, I think that's a reasonable compromise that a, a parent can reach out to the elementary teacher and, and the teacher will know which of her children, you know, she should pick up the phone call mom and dad. Just a thought. Okay, Mrs. Felton. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Dr. Robinson, I'd just like to get information on the A at the bottom where you're you speaking of virtual options will be thoroughly explored and I assume that you're still looking into it. What is the waiting list? I know at the beginning of school, we had parents calling and wanted to do it, to do virtual, but we didn't have space. So what is the waiting list? What does that look like? And can you give me any kind of um, expectation of that thoroughly explored looks like? Because that is happening. I've gotten a lot of calls concerning that as well. And they're waiting to hear. So could you expand on that, please? Yeah, yes, ma'am. So we have Virtual Virginia right now as mm -hmm. our primary um, virtual option. We also have the Virginia Beach Digital Campus. Mm -hmm. Right now, we uh, it was we had a presentation today. We have roughly 1,200 students uh, in, enrolled in Virtual Virginia for the second semester. Every parent who was on a waiting list in the first semester because they didn't get in and still wanted to get in, every one of those students got into Virtual Virginia. They actually started class uh, the 19th for the second semester because their calendar's a little bit off of ours. Uh, Virtual Virginia has closed their registration December 15th. We didn't have any other parents sitting on a waiting list. So currently, all of our STEM families who want a virtual option are in a virtual option. What we can anticipate is there will be families that are very uncomfortable having their children in, in classrooms in close proximity to students that are not wearing a mask. And what we need to do is ascertain what is the scope of that. Is it, is it 100 students? Is it 500 students? Is it 1,000 students? Because, 
and we will survey parents to ascertain their interest. Once we get that scope, then we will determine working with the state, is there an opportunity to expand virtual Virginia? Uh, is there an opportunity with our own Virginia Beach digital learning campus that we have available seats? Do we have the ability to shuffle schedules with teachers who may have an underlying condition where they they'd also be uncomfortable and want to teach virtually? It's way too early to tell because we don't have those numbers. So the very first thing we would do is ascertain the level of interest and then we would immediately dive into Okay, so what are the possible solutions? And as you know, I mean, I think that our school division has been Harry Houdini mm -hmm. in terms of what we've been able to pull off, but we hesitated to say that we could guarantee a, a virtual option because we do not know what the scope of, of any concerns might be. Thank you. Is that it for now, Mrs. Felton? Yes, thank okay. you. Mrs. Manning. Um, so, while I also don't want to burden our teachers with any additional paperwork, if we could find a way, um, this is all, all along this has been about parental choice for me, um, and whether that parent chooses to have a mask on their child or not, I do strongly believe it's a parental choice, including for those who want their child to wear a mask. Um, so if we could figure out a way, um, to monitor that so that parents who are concerned that they want to make sure their child is wearing a mask in the classroom, I think that they have that right. Um, so if we can, can maybe have some sort of compromise, if there's a parent that is concerned um, that their child won't wear a, a mask while they're at school and they want them to, we need to uh, abide by that choice as well. Okay. Ms. Owens and then Ms. Ms. Williams. Thank you. I have, um, I have quite a few questions, but I, I will do a couple and you can cut me off and I'll let somebody else go in, into the queue. We'll let you know. Thank you. Um, I guess I do have a lot of concerns about uh, the situation. Uh, you mentioned changes in quarantine uh, policy if we uh, move forward with having masks optional. Uh, I know previously our close contact uh, was determined kind of masking was a part of that. So if both parties had masks on, then they may not be considered a, a close contact and there was all kinds of you know, nuances. Uh, if we are gonna have masks optional and we are not having something in the high school level that tracks who is masked and who is not masked, how are we making that determination for close contacts or are we now going to just consider everybody a close contact because we don't have the capability to track who's masking or not masking? So, uh, Dr. Badati, did you hear that question? I did. Um, so, can you hear me all right? Yes. We can. Welcome. Wonderful. Thank you. And thank you again, you know, for the opportunity to join you all this evening. Um, so, it's a great question and I think what I can tell you, and, and I'm so incredibly grateful for the collaboration we've had with our, our colleagues, you know, over over the school system, it would be something that we'd absolutely need to consider. And there'd be a few reasons, right? One is certainly in light of any policy changes related to the executive order, but also just in light, as we've talked about before, of the current burden of the virus and also the evolving public health approaches that we take to how to manage this. So. What I can tell you is it's something that we take a careful look at. We work with our school colleagues to come up with a way to make sure that we were providing people with information about potential exposures and really continuing to reinforce for everybody what the best practice recommendations are, which haven't changed and continue to be getting vaccinated and boosted, wearing masks and practicing social distancing, and of course, staying home when you're sick. Ms. Mussel, does that answer your question? Not, I mean, it, it was some helpful information, but I still want, want to understand what the district policy would be in regards to quarantining close contacts and how we're going to determine close contacts. 
Yeah, no, I, I appreciate that. And if, if you're sensing that you're not getting um, concrete parameters, it's because I can tell you that they're very much under review right now. So, you know, what we would want to do is make sure we talked over the next couple of days about how we would implement that moving forward next week. And there's a few pieces to it. So one is with the current significant virus activity that we're seeing, we would continue to be making broad recommendations and notifications to people about potential exposure. And then we would continue to keep an eye on, you know, virus trends and virus activity and make adjustments as those case numbers come down and we resume some of those more specific assessments to determine, you know, what we think is the best practice recommendation for people who are exposed. But you're absolutely right. People who have an exposure, right, which we still define as being within six feet for 15 minutes would still be the recommendation for people who we want to quarantine or stay home. And if somebody is unable to practice mask use, you know, for that period of time in accordance with the new CDC guidance, then that would mean the recommendation in order to limit the spread of the virus would be to stay home. Okay, so, so what I hear you saying is uh, the quarantine period obviously would need to be 10 days for everybody because we're not going to be keeping track of who's masking and not masking anybody who's within a six feet uh, distance of somebody who has been positive. Um, but right now, we don't have the capacity to notify the people who've been within a six feet distance of their close contact. That yeah, and, and again, I, I understand that that feels very difficult and it's related to the incredible increase in virus activity that we saw in a very short period of time. And it's exactly why we do everything we can on the public health side to make very broad, um, you know, information sharing messages and announcements, um, you know, when there's been an increase in activity because we want people to have that high degree of suspicion for something like COVID if you're feeling sick. And that's what brings us back to our messaging around staying home when you're sick. But you're right, when the virus activity is high and the case numbers are high, we have to issue that messaging broadly as opposed to being able to have that more detailed level of information. And so that does mean, since we might not always get that detail, the recommendation would be going back to that 10 days to limit the spread of the virus, um, you know, if we can't be confident about mask usage. Okay, thank you. That That's helpful. Um, and it kind of brings me into my next question. We, as every other district in the state and probably country, have been struggling staffing-wise uh, during this elevated COVID uh, period. And our admin has been amazing trying to go out and, and you know substitute. Our staff members have been doing everything they can to cover each other's classes and be Houdini for however long. We've talked about how long that's going to be sustainable, and now we're saying that I assume our staff members also will be included in these 10-day quarantines instead of the five-day quarantines, or will they not? No, ma'am. So if you notice on the slide, it says student quarantine. Staff quarantine is a little <laughs> bit different because staff are still required to mask. The issue with quarantining five versus 10 days is the five-day quarantine recommendation from the CDC says when you come back from that quarantine, you have to be fully masked for the next five days. And because we are going to be in a position where there will be some children who will not be fully masked during that five-day period, we're pushing everybody back to a 10-day quarantine so we, because it will be impossible to police that in the classroom level. Staff will still be quarantined, therefore they'll still be able to fall into the five-day quarantine. They'll still be masking, therefore they'll still be able to fall into the five-day quarantine. Okay. Um, do we have any um, initial thoughts on uh, how this may impact our staffing from where we're at and numbers still kind of not peaking quite yet? So uh, I would say welcome to our world of hypothetical planning. Um, and so um, if we look at, if we use uh, March 2020 as a metric, as a comparable, we did have a uh, number of staff during that initial surge that presented documentation of, of a health condition. We were able to stand up a VLC. Those numbers were not large. Now, we're in a position now where we really can't lose any teachers. Um, so hypothetically, I can't answer that question. Uh, I, I would suspect 
that we will have some number of staff who can present medical documentation that places them in a, a really delicate place that we would have to try to work with to the best of our ability. And certainly, if we were able to stand up a virtual option, that would help. But that will take time. Sure. And with that in mind, I know a number, I, I don't know what percentage of our staff are also parents in our school. And so when we are extending the quarantining of students, it also affects their ability to show up to school. Um, and so I just, I'm trying to find out, and I know we are all hypothetical at this point and it's all hypothetical planning, but what, what this is gonna snowball into. We, we've been able to maintain staying open and staying five days and so many of our students need that. And is this step going to be what snaps it and brings us back to virtual because we don't have the staff to sustain it? Right. So the, I think the short answer is we, we don't know. Sure. And we won't know until that evolves. And as that evolves, we'll do what we've been doing, which is responding accordingly. And as we've done throughout this um, pandemic and certainly since the new year, um, our intention is to continue to set a new school year. Our intention is to assess a school impact and to close classrooms and schools as necessary, depending on our ability to staff those buildings appropriately, supervise students. Um, you know, all of the things that we've indicated in the past would be reasons that we might need to close a classroom or a school. So it's going to come down to school impact. If we find that we have a staffing shortage in a building that makes it difficult for us to supervise students in that building, then we'd be informing the board about closing that school. We haven't been in that position yet. You all have seen that other school divisions have been in that position. Okay. Um, and it, it certainly is a possibility that Virginia Beach could find ourselves in that position. But again, that's, that's pure speculation. And so until those situations evolve, I can't answer that question directly for you. And Ms. Ms. Owens, I will add just for the view in public, we meet with our Virginia Beach Department of Public Health team every day at four o'clock. And that meeting has two components. The first part of that meeting is we get a report from Heidi Sawala, our coordinator of health services, and she gives us the case count from that day and uh, talks to us about any particular issues within the schools. And then we hear immediately from the Virginia Beach Department of Public Health team, the epidemiologists, et cetera, who will then at that point tell us if they are concerned about any particular school, any particular grade level, or any particular classroom. And we have had some schools that we have watched, but we have not had to close a classroom since the two that we closed in early October. The second part of that meeting every day is we look at staffing data in terms of who is, who is going to be out the next day. And we do it day by day. Human Resources provides us a report four times a day for the next day. We get a 12 o'clock, a 4 o'clock, an 8 o'clock, and then the next morning we get a 545. So Mr. Delaney, who has high schools first, is on the phone at 545 looking at his list of, of our alternates and assigning them as necessary if anyone wasn't assigned the night before. And at this point, we've had a great week this week. We've had the best week this week that we've had since early December in terms of the number of staff out. The first two weeks of January were rough. Okay, and that's, that's certainly good. Good to know, and I, again, appreciate, I know that staff is working weekends, five o'clock in the morning, whatever hours of the evening, across the board in the buildings and, and in our admin, so I, I acknowledge that. I, I worry about how long that's sustainable, um, but I, I appreciate it. Um, can we, so in looking at the um, executive order, I know one of the things that's mentioned on there is the, uh, vaccinations being available for children five and up. Um, can you, if you have numbers, tell us about how many students we serve who are under the age of five in our buildings who are not vaccine eligible, who are gonna be affected by our decision? I can get that number for you. I don't know what it is. Okay. I, I mean, I, I guess it's not a question. I, I have concerns about the students that we serve who are not vaccine eligible because they're not at that age, that we have these pre-K programs, that we have students who have disabilities and receive early interventions through our school system. And we're moving forward with 
knowing that they can't be vaccinated, knowing that they are actually the most vulnerable population. That's why they qualify to be in these programs. Um, and so, you know, I, I have obviously those concerns. Uh, I want, like all of us, I believe, do to be able to keep schools open and those students are receiving services because they need them. And I would hate to see us make a decision that ends up cutting off those services because those pre-K students and the students with uh, special needs who are getting those services aren't gonna get special needs, adequate special needs services virtually. I mean, it's not gonna happen. Um, and so I, I have a lot of concerns. I understand that we're in a position where we have this com conflict, conflicting legislation on both sides. And I think you laid it out well with the option A, option B, option C. Um, I don't know if I love the King Solomon dilemma analogy because it sounds like we're deciding between mom A or mom B and so we're suggesting let's cut the baby in half. I don't know that I, I love that with option C, but um, I think we need clarity and I, there's not a, a whole lot of ways for us to, to get that. I know that there is uh, you know, lawsuits and things pending uh, with the Virginia Supreme Court right now. And, you know, I, I think it's, it's worth being discussed uh, how that weighs in on our decision. Um, if that's something we need to be looking at to see outcomes and if that's something that we need to be looking at talking to our attorney about filing uh, some kind of brief to be involved to get that clarification. I'm seeing opinions kind of, you know, I hate that it's so political, but from Republican and Democrats saying the executive order can't override a bipartisan legislation that was passed. Whether that's correct or not, it's up for the courts to decide. Uh, but for us to be a part of something before the courts so that we can get that clarification. And if the courts say, no, executive orders can override bipartisan legislation that's been passed by our elected officials, then the clarity is there and the clarity becomes there for the entire state. Um, for us to be making the interpretations without asking the court for the clarification just seems not, not like where I'd want us to be. And so that's my thought on that. And you know, Ms. Owens, um, I mean, I think generally, um, I would agree till we get to the end of that, which is I don't think we're making any interpretations at this point. I think what we're doing is acknowledging that we are operating under the auspices of a state law, which allows and suggests we ought to keep a mask mandate in place. And also acknowledging that there is an executive order from our governor, which allows parents to determine that they're not going to participate, uh, that their children won't wear masks in, in, in the case of a mask mandate. And what we're doing is not interpreting that. What we're doing is saying that those two things exist simultaneously. Should the courts interpret that differently as we've done all the way through this mess of this pandemic, we'll, we'll adjust accordingly to whatever new information arises. And we'll share that information with you and with our community as that information arises. But for the moment, I don't think we're making any interpretations. I think what we're doing is saying these two things exist and we have to find a way as a school division to coexist under the auspices of both the executive order and SB 1303. It's a unique position to be in. It's, uh, I mean, obviously I think everybody kind of understands that, right? This is a very interesting and unique position to be in. School boards, as we've stated, are directly in the middle of this and left without a lot of very clear guidance on the issue. And so I, my position, my, which is why my position and our recommendation as an administrative team to you is we, not, we ought not to be in the position of trying to interpret that. We ought to be in the position of adhering to both. Okay, we'll go ahead and then we'll do another round. Mrs. Weems? Um, yes. <clears throat> Excuse me. I just want to thank Dr. Robertson and Dr. Spence and your whole team. We know how hard you've been working. Um, we've been struggling with this dilemma as well, and so I just appreciate that. Um, I don't see the Solomon's <laughs> um, comparison as, as choosing baby A and baby B because I think you didn't do that. I think if you chose baby A or baby B or, or, or who gets the baby, it would have been cho 
choosing no masks at all or complete masks. And I think you did the compromise. You saved the baby. So I appreciate that. Um, I hope my colleagues support this. I really do. Um, in, in light of, of recent countries doing away with mask mandates, entire countries have done that in the, in the last few days. Entire states have done it. Florida, South Carolina, Texas, to name just three. And their numbers are lower than ours or just about what ours are. Chesapeake has done it in the last few minutes. In light of that, I think that it's something that people are really looking at. Parental choice, option, freedom to choose what's best for you and your family. In light of data showing that masks have, have academically harmed some of our children, especially those in speech, when they have to have a mask, their teacher can't understand them, they can't see. Um, socially, it has harmed our children. They can't see cues of smiles, of frowns. Um, and physically, it has harmed some of our children. In light of the recent CDC guidance, and again, CDC it guides, it is not law. They have come out with so many new guidances on proper masks. They have said that the proper one that really does the job is the N95, which basically the majority of our students, I would say in the 90, 95 percentile, are not wearing. Okay, they have even said you need to have a 95 or a nose piece. If you touch the mask, it needs to be replaced, and we're not going by that guidance. In light of us following executive orders by our previous governor, we need to follow this executive order and not be partisan and political. In light of if you believe that mask works, this does not prevent you from wearing a mask. You can wear any type of mask you want. You can wear two masks. You can wear a mask and a shield to protect yourself. In light of this, I'll have to disagree with my colleague, uh, Ms. Owens. I do think that you don't make an interpretation of the law before it goes to court. Yeah, this is going to end up in court, but it's not our job to interpret what it means and wait for the court to decide. It is our job to do the neutral, the option, the honoring all by choice, and then the courts are going to deal with it. And we may have to change. I don't know. But we can't say, oh, well, the court really is going to come out with that answer, so we're going to do this. We have to wait. I think this does honor all. I think it gives choice. You can wear a mask, and you don't, or you don't have to wear a mask. In light of the things that I'm seeing in our community, most people are not wearing masks. I have been to a soccer game practice night before last. I counted close to 300 people indoors. Seven people had masks. Of those seven, one was an N95. That leads me to believe that that's not a minority. The minority were, were wearing masks. I've been to church. Two or three people have had masks. I've been to the tra trampoline park. Two or three people have worn masks. I've been to Target. A handful of people had masks. I went to Kroger today. About 60% had masks. There were two with an N95 masks. Of the 40%, probably 10 had masks under their nose. Five or six had them under their chin. I have been to private schools. I am very involved in one private school. Two kids at the private school that I'm at every day Two out of the whole population wear masks. Our other private schools, they're optional in the area. I know of four. I'm not saying all, but I do know of four that are optional. The Supreme Court, no masks. Construction companies, no masks. 
I, most con the construction companies that I deal with, not all, Ms. Melnick, I'm sorry. Um, I didn't need to speak on yours. The climbing gym, two masks this week. <laughs> Weddings, I've been to several. The majority, no masks. City council, the majority, no masks. So I don't think when I hear colleagues saying the loud minority, that's not true in my opinion. So I think this is very fair. I think that it gives option. If you think the masks work, protect yourself and wear that mask. I hope my colleagues will support this. We need to support the executive order just like we supported Governor Northam's order. We cannot choose because of political beliefs which governor and which executive order to hold as the gospel. With that being said, I don't, I'm not thrilled about anything with uh, everything with option C, but I will compromise because I think it's a compromise and I will agree, agree to all in C. I will agree to add what Mrs. Um, Anderson says. I think especially, like Ms. Rice said, at the elementary level, you're talking about teachers having 20, 25 students. That may be, let's just say half decide not to wear a mask. That is taking in 10 notes. I don't see any huge burden about an elementary school teacher taking in 10 notes saying, I am opting out or however we want to do it or make sure my child wears a mask all day. I have no problem with that. With the middle and high school, I think maybe if we, you know, that's a little sticky because teachers have so many different classes and, and so many different students, up to 150. If we can't, you know, decide a way to do that, I would compromise with just the elementary, but if maybe if we just say, I mean, there's no guess, you know, we can't guess how many want to, you know, still wear masks and everything. Please make sure my child wears a mask all day and somehow get that in, you know, and send it to all the teachers. I'm not sure how to do that. I would. Um, I think we can I, handle that administratively. Okay, so administratively, if we could somehow handle that, because again, I, I do believe this is parental choice, and I do think that if parents want their child in masks, they need to be assured that that child is going to wear a mask and that, you know, Rylan's not going to go to school and then somehow just ditch the mask because her friends are ditching the mask. So I do think that parental choice, it needs to be known to the teacher. If we could somehow figure that out, I would totally support that. But I hope my colleagues do this. I think that it's the right thing, the choice. It follows the executive order with also um, giving honor to the um, <coughs> to the SB 1303, and um, I, I, I really do think this is the best thing to do. And so how, about, how about students entering the clinic? Oh, I, I, I support. If you're sick and you, you have a clinic, I think the teacher has to have masks there because some of them may not be masked. And the teacher, if, if you know, Johnny goes up and says, I feel you know, sick, and, and teacher sees that they're flushed, the teacher says, well, for precaution, Johnny, wear this mask to the nurse. I, I'm totally fine with that. So I hope that with these um, little changes that my colleagues um, will support this. Thank you so much. And again, Dr. Spence and Dr. Robertson and everybody, Doc, um, Dr. Um, Padati, thank you for your input. And I hope we can move forward and be all on the same page on this. Thank you. Okay, Mrs. Franklin and then Mrs. Hughes. Okay, and colleagues, I'm just going to ask for your patience because I probably would be diagnosed ADHD these days, so I really probably need to just read this from my, my notes. So I, I appreciate your patience. Um, you know, this has been a really difficult um, discussion because, you know, when we talk about following the science, the problem is that you can find different experts that who give you incredibly different scientific views. Um, we have had several physicians on both sides of the mask discussion, all citing reasons why we should or should not mask. Even an official of the CDC, as Ms. Weems stated, after years of wearing cloth masks, came out and said that there were little more than facial decorations. We have learned that only the N95 mask will be completely effective in helping prevent the spread of COVID. And, you know, I'm, I've looked for the N95 mask, and it's really hard to find. And quite frankly, if I'm required to wear a mask, I would really like to wear one that's effective. 
Um, so if you guys hear from those, I'd really appreciate any input on that. Um, so here's what I know, not from the science, but from my own experience. I am thankful to God every day that I'm still alive after playing on seesaws that sit on an asphalt playground as a child. Growing up on a farm with all of the equipment that farmers use, being in the military, driving a vehicle for over 30 years, years before we even thought of have, uh, COVID, knew of COVID, I was in the hospital with pneumonia and still suffer from the effects of that with exercise and juice asthma. Other illnesses have long lasting impacts on our lives as well. And because my lungs were already compromised in the past and the fact that I had a close family member with cancer, I did decide to double vax and get the booster. I've done everything I can to take the necessary precautions and knock on wood, I haven't gotten COVID that I've known of through a positive test. Those that choose to not get the vaccinations or mask understand the risk, but they make that choice for themselves and their family. Omicron is rapidly spreading, but luckily, and most likely because we are building some herd immunity, this variant is weaker, and even my 80-some-year-old mother-in-law just contracted it post-Christmas and said that it was similar to the flu and she felt tired, but not much more than that. And I can't tell you how scared I was when I found out that she had gotten it after taking all of the precautions possible. She lives in a senior community where they definitely are on high alert about the spread of this virus. But after hearing about her experience and experience and those of about 30 other people that have I know uh, that have gone to COVID since the holidays, none of them have had much more than fl or flu or cold like symptoms. In fact, not even as bad as the respiratory virus that I got in uh, before COVID was even in existence. Um, so with that, I don't fear that I might get Omicron. I'm an avid hand washer, have gotten my shots, tried to socially distance when I can. But outside of that, I am ready to move on and let the kids move on as well. Life is, has, and always will come with risks. But in most cases, we tell our children to live their lives and not fear the unknown. Public speaking is often described as one of the things that people fear the most. But if your child is struggling with that, or anyone struggling with that, we want to help them push through that fear get to get to the other side of that and really find success. And I'm hoping at this point that we can push through the fear of this pandemic and the fear of the new variant and get to the other side of this. Now, I, I just wanna thank Dr. Robinson, Dr. Spence, leadership, Dr. Badati. I love, I actually love option C. And I would ask, of course, anybody that chooses to not mask their children, that we use common sense and keep your sick children at home um, and I also like, I appreciate the fact that we're still following the federal, uh, federal mandates to mandate mask on buses. And I love that we added the, the um, addition about the nurses because I do believe that just like when you go to a private clinic that we should continue to uh, mask in those, in, in those um, areas. Um, but if we are not at the point where it is now an endemic, we are getting close and taking a family's right to choose is a very slippery slope that should only be used under the most dire circumstances. Um, I don't think that option C overrides SB 1303 since we are still considering and taking the advice of the VDH and working with them very closely. With that said, I am asking my colleagues to seriously consider choosing option C, please. Thank you. Okay, Mrs. Hughes. So one of the sticking Oops. One of the sticking points seems to be that we're discussing a conflict between 1303 and Executive Order 2. And um, so the actual author of SB 1303 put out a statement, and it says essentially the relevant parts here is that SB 1303 has been used against our children and against its intent this school year to advance an agenda. SB 1303 does not mandate the use of masks in school because the CDC does not mandate masks. Governor Glenn Youngkin's executive order does not ban masks. It just gives parents options. Just like 1303 does not mandate masks, it gives school boards a roadmap to keep schools open. Today, we know that the risk of hospitalization for children is almost none. In fact, of Virginia's estimated almost 1.9 million children 0.07% have, hosp <clears throat> have been hospitalized with COVID-19 since March of 2020. At the same time, the use of masks in schools presents risk of learning loss, social emotional challenges, and other issues. Parents continually and logically, I'm sorry, constitutionally and logically, are the best people to do an analysis of what is best for their child. 
the risk of COVID-19 to children does not justify the universal need for masks in school, nor does SB 1303 mandate the use of masks. It is time for our governing bodies, including school boards, to develop achievable off-ramps for the COVID-19 protocols based on sound scientific principles. The default option should always be normalcy for our children unless there is evidence or metrics to back up the protocol. Now, Senator, Senator Dunavent, who is the chief patron of this, is a practicing physician and wrote this, and this is her interpretation, and this is exactly why she wrote it, this is what she meant. So if there's any confusion, use her words. If you're, you were using her words and her bill to keep mask on, now you understand that was not the intent. So if 1303 is what you're making your decision on, then you, you need to understand that that was actually not the intent. Another thing, as we've discussed executive orders over the last couple of years, I mean, our previous governor was spitting out executive orders like a Pez dispenser. Now we just have this here that applies to schools. And it says in it, it references section 44-146.17. And in that, in that piece of code, it states that violating an executive order is a class one misdemeanor. Now I know with previous orders, this board has been very concerned about opening themselves up to liability for not following orders. And so based on the plain language reading of this, that's exactly what you would be doing if you, if you try to defy it. And the last thing that I wanna mention here because people have brought up the, um, a lawsuit in, in Chesapeake. In theory, you know, initially this was two weeks to flatten the curve. We're now nine weeks away from two years of flattening the curve. And you're gonna just have to accept that once a virus is alive, it's always going to be alive. You're gonna have to assess risk. You're going to have to make decisions based on your personal health profile. Um, there are things that I don't do because I just simply can't do them and, and everybody is that way. But it would appear based on this lawsuit that this is not intended by some people to be something temporary. And just one little passage here, a couple little sentences out of this petition. Petitioners have no adequate remedy at law and no time to spare. They and their children are likely to suffer irreparable harm and damage if this court declines to grant immediate relief. The court should declare that executive order number two is void and unenforceable and should grant prohibition, mandamus, and other appropriate relief initially on an emergency and temporary basis. And this is the part that should really chill you. And ultimately on a permanent final basis. These people are filing a lawsuit because they want these to be permanent. This is the time that we need to stand up as a board and say, there is no way that we are gonna allow these children to permanently be stuck in these masks. And parents are gonna to have to stand up and say, no more, just no more. It's been two years and it's been just one more week, one more month, one more marking period, one more holiday season, once vaccines are available. And we're gonna to have to acknowledge based on this language and based on the fact that there is always just one more thing that this is intended to be permanent and it needs to stop. It just, this needs to be cut off now. We have to care about these children enough to get them out of these masks. Okay, Mrs. Melnick. So, um, while everybody's had a comment, uh, one person has mentioned a teacher. And I want to say to my teacher friends, um, I'm sorry. I'm a rule follower, so um, I'm going to do what I have to do, and I'm sorry. Um, but through what Dr. Robertson called nearly two years of hypothetical planning, which had to be done. Um, nobody's ever, ex we've never experienced this. Um, 
it's been difficult and you guys have done a darn good job. Um, we recently got an A plus from the health department and they said it was because we were smart enough to wear masks. And yes, it doesn't, it's not going to prevent everything, but it certainly has helped. And, um, but through our two years of hypothetical planning, we've had one constant and that's our teachers. And I bet right now, Mrs. Hughes, they would love their only problem to be a permission slip <laughs> from a parent. These are men and women who have risen far beyond our expectations. Um, when, when we were virtual, um, when we were half and half, when we are experiencing things together for the first time when we think we're almost there and then we have a surge and we have to start again when parents are yelling and screaming at you and there are I, I just I just can't imagine and and we even have more coming we're, we're changing programs for our, for our um, grading systems, we're changing the high school model. Um, we ask more and more of you every single day. And somehow you show up every single day. And I know why I did it. I did it for 17 years. It's because you love those kids. And that's the next thing that's gonna happen. You're gonna have other children who, and it's gonna take some time, but on Monday you'll have nervous kids who are now sitting next to kids who now aren't wearing masks and they're going to be afraid and it's going to take a mental shift. We're going to have to learn how to, to redo all of this, but those are realities and people can laugh. People can make comments about it, but the truth is if you looked over here and you asked a teacher and what I just said came out of a teacher's mouth, perhaps you would believe it. It's truth. It is their reality. They are in a classroom for seven hours a day with 30 kids. You're not going to be at Target with 30 kids for seven hours in a small confined space. They're afraid. I watched a news report before I came today that said, you're right. Many people are going to get COVID. Many people aren't even going to know they have it. The the hardest part is if you do get it, you don't know how you're going to react. And that's hard. And so teachers, thank you. Thank you for getting up every day and doing what you do every single day. And I hope and I pray that what comes out of this is really the uplifting of our educational professionals the uplifting of every single person that walks into a school building and does something for our students in whatever capacity that is, that those people are heroes again to the rest of this world. Find a way to make teachers and educational professionals heroes again, and they need your support. Thanks y'all. So we'll be going into closed after this round, and we're not done yet with this part, so I may reserve other comments for later. I think I just want to get out there that I think it needs to be said that this board, or certainly I can speak for myself, um, the concept of public health has been missing from this conversation, so I, want, I think that needs to be acknowledged. And, and public health isn't just about one, just about me, it's about who I interact with, and that's what makes this so difficult because, and I'll probably ask Dr. Padati this, but for example, the efficacy of masks, it's acknowledged, increases when both are wearing a mask. So you still, you have your, you have a certain element of protection when it's just you, but I mean, am I, Dr. Padati, you want to comment on that? Would you? Yeah. 
Nope, you're absolutely right. So when you think about the ways that you layer a tool like a mask, there's a couple of ways that it's helpful, right? So one of the ways is what we call source control. And that's where, you know, if you think about it, it makes sense. You know, if you think about what we used to say about flu, right, cover your cough. Um, if you can cover a cough or a sneeze, you can reduce droplets. And so that very much helps limit the spread of a person to person respiratory virus like COVID. And then similarly, wearing a mask for somebody who is susceptible, right, but is not the sick person helps prevent those droplets from being breathed into the respiratory system and entering our systems through the mucous membrane. So there's benefit on both ends. So thank you for that. Uh, so for me, it's always been about, and, and I think the division from the get-go, if we were to pull out that original COVID plan, it, it's about, it's always been about the, the goal of in-person instruction balanced with the health and safety of our students and staff. So that's what's, what it's always been about for me. Uh, I do want to, I think I just need to also mention back to this concept of public health, a few months back to respond to a parent email, or what, a, I can't say if it was a parent or a teacher, but I went on the DOE website and looked up, there's a, vac, there's a list of vaccines that families are required to honor before entering their child in kindergarten. And the list is tw not just necessarily kindergarten, but it's a list that's 12 or 15 vaccines. And so those are, those are, that list is there because of public, for a public health reason. And so I, I just get very frustrated when, when that element of this whole conversation isn't acknowledged. Uh, it, it's not, a, I'm not addressing specifically the recommendation, um, but, I, but I did want to share that. So Dr. Padati, some, so with, because you know, a lot of the emails we've received acknowledge, you know, that this is, this was one of the layer, the mitigation layers we relied on. And so by removing this layer, what's, what is your thoughts as our public health director, uh, from a public health perspective, how do you, how do you view this? Yeah. So again, you know, I, I know this continues to be really tough. Um, the, the public health best practice recommendations for how to lower the spread of this virus are still the same. So still starts with vaccine, right? Because that's how we prevent somebody from getting sick and hopefully seriously sick or, or death. Um, and then also using things layered on top of that, that help limit the ability of a virus to move from one of us to the other. So masks, hand washing, distancing, and of course, staying home when you're sick. So in terms of, you know, what you might expect to see, right, if you make changes to those mitigation measures, um, it, it really depends, right, on um, the level of virus activity, which is still high here in Virginia Beach. Um, and also, again, on how we use all of those mitigation strategies together. So the more we layer them together, the more we can reduce that virus activity. Um, and, and in terms of what you might see, depending on how well they're used, it is certainly possible that if there, you know, there's not as much use of those mitigation strategies and virus activity is high, yeah, you can potentially see continued virus activity. So I do want to state for the record, I do trust our administration that with the data that would be monitored if this plan was implemented. So I, I think that's been well acknowledged here. So thank you for that. Okay, Mrs. Holtz. Thank you. I, I'm glad that the, some of the last few speakers did address the, real, the reason why initially we started wearing masks. We live in a community and in order to protect the wearers, it's not just to protect the person wearing the mask, but also your neighbor, person next to you. I don't see any middle ground here. Unless everyone is wearing a mask, we've lost that layer of mitigation that is protecting us and protecting our children. That's what I'm really thinking of. And what about the, we've talked a lot about, I have a right to not wear a mask. What about the rights of the students who don't want to be exposed to the kids who are unmasked? I mean, I haven't heard anybody talking about that yet. Right now, 
we have a 40% positivity rate, the highest we've had in this almost two year thing. I know we're fatigued. Don't let the fatigue of this virus get to us. If the virus says, I'm gonna wait one more one month, yeah, I'm willing to do that. And if it says next month, I'm gonna wait one more month, yeah, I think we should do that. That's, we need to do that for protection. This, it has to be either universal or not. You just can't have a choice. It's not a choice. We're a community. We have to work together as a community for safety. And if it, um, if it does come down to the courts, let it come down to the courts. But until it does, I think we should retain the masking policy that we set, well, what was it, eight, almost a year ago. We need to keep that. Let the courts settle it if, it if they can. But I'm willing to wait. I'm not going to let this, this virus beat me down into just giving up because I'm so tired of it. And that's it. OK, it looks like we're back to round two, Mrs. Ms. Owens and then Mrs. Weems. Thank you. And I, I appreciate the, the comments of all of my colleagues and that we're able to have this as a discussion. Um, I think it's important for me to clarify, at least for myself, when I hear uh, concerns that the goal is to keep masks and keep all of this forever, that that's not my goal. My goal and what I'm looking at is the law that's in place, and I know that, which has an expiration date. It's not a, a law that's in place forever. It's set to expire in August. Uh, I, take uh, Ms. Hughes, uh, I guess, point perhaps about the CDC not mandating the masks. Um, but what the bill says is that schools shall, shall meaning required, to follow the safety mitigations that are recommended by the CDC. The CDC doesn't mandate any of those safety mitigations. They don't mandate the spacing or the quarantine. They, those are their recommendations. And the law says that we shall follow those. And so that's what I'm looking at in terms of that law. I will say that uh, Ms. Weems made some good points in regards to uh, the quality of masking and kind of the lesser effects of cloth and other forms of masking. And so I think it's really important as a board that if we end up moving forward with an option that as a district we make the commitment to ensure that our staff members and students who would like KN95 masks have the ability to get them in school the same way we are providing the masking that we're providing for them now. Um, we are definitely putting them in a, a difficult, to put it lightly, a difficult position. And so ensuring that at a minimum they have the high quality uh, protective measures that they need, I think is very important. Uh, Ms. Weems pointed out that she's going places and she's seeing just two or three people wearing masks or 60% of people somewhere unmasked. And I think that we need to perhaps keep that in mind if that's what our school buildings are gonna look like. If we're gonna go into school buildings and see just two or three people wearing masks or 60% of that. Um, and when we think of what that would look like and we think about the parental choice that that is playing out, how does that affect the quarantining? If my child or anybody else's child chooses to wear a mask but is seated next to a child who's not wearing a mask and that child becomes positive, doesn't matter if my child had the mask on or not, they're now going to have to be out of school for the 10 day period. They're, somebody else's masking decision is having a great impact on somebody, else, somebody else's choices to get their education. 
And so I, I want us to be considering that when we're talking about two to three people in a, in a classroom perhaps wearing a mask and others not being masked, if that's, if that's what Ms. Williams is seeing in, in the public. And I, I do think that certain schools may have higher populations of masks and less high populations of masks. And so certain schools may be more impacted by a positive case in their schools and the amount of time that those students are going to be out of, out of a classroom, out of in-person learning. And so I think that that's something that we just need to be very mindful of. I, I think uh, I appreciate Ms. Franklin um, talking about getting the vaccines and being boosted because she wants to keep herself as safe as possible and her family members as safe as possible. And I certainly encourage everyone who's eligible to do that. Um, and I'm sure that there are parents of pre-K kids who wish they had the opportunity to have their kids be as safe as myself and Ms. Franklin would be in that classroom. And I think that that's something that while we are thankful for, for ourselves that we need to remember we're sending students in who don't have that option to be as safe as we're thankful for. Um, I, I know that we'll have some things to talk with our attorneys about, but um, I hope that we will make a commitment as a board to ensure, however this turns out, however we decide to move forward, to ensure that we're providing uh, and making available the high quality PPE for our staff and our students. So Ms. Owens, uh, today I got, I, we finally got the quote back from the KN95 masks and the particular vendors. Um, so we've identified the funds, we've identified the price range. What's interesting is, you know, stuff's available right now. Not really. It's between 10 days and six weeks. So yes, we are prepared to, to move immediately to order those uh, in, in large quantities. Thank you. And I, I want to just say that I appreciate that Dr. Robertson and Dr. Spence that when I, I brought it up, the response was, okay, yep, we are already starting to look, look into that. And I, I really want us to make sure that we hold to that commitment to get that out to our, our staff members and students as quickly as possible. But thank you. Okay, we have um, Mrs. Weems and Mrs. Hughes. But then there's two more after that, and then it looks like we'll be ready to go into closed. Okay, yes, thank you. Um, I just want to make it clear that, that while I support option C, it does not mean in any way that I don't respect the hard work of all our teachers, no matter where you fall on this side. I totally respect the teachers have just done... Uh, an unbelievable job these last two years as our staff and as our administrators have done also um, and our parents you've got to remember for two years many 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 parents have sent their children to school in a mask not believing that it helps not believing not agreeing with it but they have sent their child to school for now almost two years in a mask they have not said, nope, I don't think it helps. I don't believe in it. I think it's hurting you. Don't wear a mask. Okay, so we have to remember that too, that other people's choices, yes, do affect us. And for two years, those choices have affected many, many, many students and many parents who have followed the law, followed the executive orders, followed what the school system has said, and they have not really believed it. Um, teachers, I have ha I have many, we have many emails, I have had phone calls, many, many teachers who are saying, please, please, please give us the option, please give teachers the option. Um, I've had teachers say, no matter what y'all do, Monday I'm not requiring masks in my classroom. So we have teachers on both sides. Okay, so we have to remember that too. Um, and I think that we also have to remember, without much debate at all, between politicians, between school boards, between lay people, between medical professions, I think we all know that this virus is transmitted whether you have a vaccine or not, and whether you're wearing a mask or not. 
it is spread. Because if it wasn't spread, we wouldn't be, none of us would be getting sick. The vaccine has hopefully, in most cases, although not all, has, it seems to have reduced these symptoms and reduced, obviously, the data tells us about hospitalizations. But it is spread no matter if you wear a mask or not, no matter if next, the people next to you wear a mask. How many of us have gotten COVID? How many people have gotten COVID who have taken so much care of themselves? Okay, so how many, you know, I've got a dear friend who got COVID last week who has put her life on hold for two years has met, met, missed granddaughter's, grandchildren's birthdays, <laughs> has worn an N95, has got vaccinated and boosted, has not gone to a restaurant in two years unless it's outdoors recently. She got COVID. Her husband got COVID. Okay, so yeah, none of it makes sense. You don't know who's going to get it. Um, Dr. Fauci just said everyone's going to be exposed to it. Everyone's going to get it. I don't know. I hope it's not true. I hope I don't get it. I hope my 90-year-old parents don't get it. But, you know, that's what they're saying. But without debate of any group, it's spreading, whether you have masks or not. So I think that we have to realize that, yes, for two years, people have been following. People have not had a choice. It's time to give them that choice with this option. And again, the teachers, any teacher who has had, the, who wants to get a vaccin vaccinated has been vaccinated and any teacher that wants to can wear one or two masks and a, and a face shield and whatever they need to do in order to, um, to, be, to feel more comfortable. So um, again, I hope that we support this compromise. Thank you. All right, Mrs. Hughes. I'm sorry, I, just, I, mm -hmm. I do wanna add, I forgot. Um, just because we're in a community of course you want to do what best for the community, but just because you're in a community, you're not stripped of your free choice. Mrs. Hughes. So I just wanted to address a few things as we've gone around the room. Ms. Rye mentioned, um, I believe you said 12 mandatory vaccines that are on there and, and nobody bats an eye. Well, a couple of things about those, they, they've been around for a while, they have FDA approval. We're not, we're not giving our children 12 vaccines a year that are emergency use only, that we don't know the long-term term effects of. Additionally, um, we're also, we've had religious and medical exemptions to those vaccines as long as they've been required, and no one has batted an eye. No one has implemented coercive policies saying, if you don't have those, you need to get tested every week. You need to walk around with with a mask on, which is like a scarlet letter when you only make unvaccinated people do that. And it, it's coercive and shaming. And we don't do that with any of those vaccines. So the behavior is not the same. Um, I do know that, that Mrs. Holtz apparently um, supports that Chesapeake lawsuit because she donated to it. And they want to make that permanent based on the verbiage which is interesting because when people from other cities come in here to speak, you let them know they need to go back to their own city, but you donated to that. Um, I think it's also important to note that while, you know, Mrs. Weems pointed out, you know, Fauci's comments that everybody's going to get this, we've been quarantining healthy children. We sat in here in a meeting one night and I asked, of all the children that you've quarantined, how many have turned up positive? And I believe the number was 1.28% that have shown symptoms. We have been quarantining healthy children, demanding this weekly testing or vaccines, masking them, not giving any choice whatsoever. Some of the comments in favor of masking have been, well, if you don't like it, then pull your kids out. That's, that's horrible. I would never tell you if you're in favor of it, pull your kids out. If you're in favor of them, wear them. We need to stop this divisive rhetoric that anytime someone disagrees with you, they hate you, they want you dead, they don't respect you. None of that stuff is true. People, reasonable people can agree to disagree. And I think when you find comments like that sneaking in to the conversation, it, it's time to walk away. Those people are not adding to the conversation. Mrs. Manning, then Mrs. Franklin, and Mrs. Anderson, and I think we'll wrap up this round. Okay. Mrs. Franklin. Actually, okay, no, that's fine. 
Okay. Okay. Um, I just want to echo uh, what Ms. Weems said about the teachers. I, I mean, I personally think they are heroes. I think this administration has done an amazing job. Um, I, pre I appreciate Dr. Padati. Um, Dr. Padati, I do have one question for you, though. Um, you know, I did go to the VDH website and I looked at the masking, and basically within one foot, which is basically from here to my, and I, know, I know you can't see me, but my laptop to here, which is a very close proximity, from there, if they're both unmasked, then there's a 100% chance of, uh, of possibly catching it, of catching it, I should say. Um, but then it goes down some, uh, a lot, a lot, um, almost down to like 0.6% or, or just a very small percent if one of them is, un, uh, is masked within a one foot distance. Now, I guess my question is, are we still keeping the kids three feet apart or is that less, is that not happening now? We'll allow staff folks in the, in the classrooms. Are they, are so, they within three feet? So in accordance with our plan, we distance to the maximum extent practical. Possible, right, okay. So in some classrooms, so as a reminder, the three feet number that we're talking about mm. is that when both students are wearing a mask, you can be as close as three feet and not be identified as a close contact and therefore need to quarantine okay. if you were exposed to somebody. Uh, so we are not, in all cases, able to get the three feet with two students' masks. And when they don't have a mask, so for example, when they're eating lunch, the number would be six feet when any one of those students is unmasked, and we can't always get to that six feet. Okay, well, with, with that being said, though, because when you look at the numbers, it does, it, even if one student is masked, the number goes down significantly in terms of the potential contact or, or um, uh, catching the, the virus. So, you know, one, one thing that I did want to mention, um, Ms. Owens, is that you did talk about the 10-day quarantine. And I have had that concern ever since school started because even with kids being masked, I have had parents who have been emailing that they have been back to back to back quarantine, and that was really a concern of mine, which I reached out to administration about, because the fact is, you know, even masked, you know, they were saying that they were contact traced and all those things and being back to back quarantine. So I guess my feeling is this at this point, and that is that, um, you know, we, we have all been through this. You know, we, we have worked through the masking. We have tr done all the things possible. And we still have this percentage that is out there. And, and, and I would say that basically, I, I think that just helps to continue building the herd immunity um, for us getting through this, this point to get to an endemic at some point. And, um, and, and honestly, we have to figure out a way, even if kids are going to school masked, even if they're masked from the very beginning of the year, and we're still seeing these issues, I mean, and the numbers now are coming down, I think it is just a natural progression. This has nothing to do, and I, I don't want anybody to think that I don't care about teachers. I, I love teachers, I love teachers, I support them. I want them to do that. And quite frankly, I have to say, it has been inappropriate for people to, to criticize me because I do mask. I really feel like it is inappropriate to label anybody, parents, kids, or whoever, whether they mask or don't mask or vaccine or don't vaccine. That is their personal choice. And I have not appreciated those people that have criticized me for masking. That is my decision. Um, but also, I do feel like that we should get to a point where we do allow this personal choice because we have come this far and we have this amazing option, I believe, which was well thought out by the administration. And so, again, I'm just going to implore um, my colleagues to just really think. I know that we all have personal feelings, strong emotions about this, but I'm going to ask you to personally think about just considering option C and seeing if we cannot allow this possibility at this moment. Thank you. So we're down to Mrs. Anderson and Mrs. Felton. So I have a couple questions. I'm not going to lecture. Um, this is not a time to be lecturing. This is information tonight. That's what we're <coughs> supposed to be doing right now is getting information, not lecturing our colleagues. Please go ahead, Mrs. Anderson. However, 
I do want to ask, what happens in a classroom when a student says, I don't want to be paired with that student because they're not masked? What, what is going to happen I and mean, what, what, I mean, how can the teachers do that? Are they going to have to alter their plans and just say, okay, we're not going to be paired up right now? I mean, are they going to be told that um, they're discriminating? against students when they pair two masked students with two students who are not masked? I mean, I think these are legitimate questions that teachers have raised, and they're worried. They don't want to be accused of being discriminatory, which is what some people have, have said, you know, how dare you, don't, don't even think about discriminating against my child because they're not wearing a mask. That's what we've been accused of. So I'd like you to give a little bit of answer to that, and also, what, what is going to constitute a classroom to have to go virtual? I mean, what kind of numbers are we looking at? So let me ask, let me answer the last question first. Okay. And again, in that health meeting we have every day at four o'clock, we look at case numbers. We provide the case numbers to the health department and the health department, the epidemiologists take a look at uh, whether or not they constitute an outbreak and then they will make a recommendation as to whether or not a class would close. So there's not a distinct number. It's not like the number is three, and that's the threshold, because each of the situations are, are unique. But every day we are in a position to immediately respond to a particular outbreak in a class. To your first question, it's a more difficult question. Yeah. Because that is, I think we all recognize that uh, there's one particular group that's stuck right in the middle, and that's teachers. Yep, they are. Because they are going to have students in their class who are not masked. Mm -hmm. And there will be some teachers who are very comfortable with that. There will be other teachers who are not comfortable with that at all. And those teachers will have to make some decisions within their own classroom bounds in terms of how do they put together a small group. Is a small group only group students in a particular small group that are unmasked? Well, certainly you don't want to use that approach because the purpose of small group is to group them by their needs, their academic needs. Right. But that absolutely will be a challenge that teachers will have to face. Well, I hope we're able to give our teachers support when it comes to that. And if anybody accuses a teacher of being discriminatory over a mask issue, I hope that they'll think twice about it because we're certainly putting our teachers in a really bad position. I mean, as a school board, we're in a bad position right now trying to decide whether we should follow the law or whether we should follow uh, governor's executive order. I mean, we're, we're between a rock and a hard place too. But now we've, we've really put our teachers in, in a position where they're going to have to make some tough yep. decisions and if, too. And if our parents that are listening hear one thing tonight, they need to hear how important our teachers are. Because yes. when we turned in March and those parents became teachers, when our kids went home, teachers were heroes then. It was like, oh my God, I can't believe what you do. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I think we can all be reminded how difficult that job is. It's extremely rewarding. But it's They're going to be difficult. reminded tomorrow, oh, by the way. <laughs> yes. It's, but it's, very, it's a rewarding job, but it's very difficult, and we, and we need to lift people up now. Right. Okay. Well, I just, I, I want the teachers to, under, to know that we are, we have your back. We, we, are, we have been helping you. We have been trying to protect the students and the teachers and all of our staff. We've been trying to do so for the past two years as best we can, and but we're just in a absolutely between a rock and a hard place. That's all I can put it right now. Okay, and Mrs. Felton, and the, thank you, Chair Rye. Um, I'd like to take this moment to thank, give a thank you to our teachers who has been on the, I call them our um, front line, uh, being out in front and doing what they had to do. And I want to thank those teachers that had COVID. And while the substitute teacher was in the room, when they could find one, they were still online helping with teaching their classes as well. And I'm talking to teachers that actually, uh, not hearing hearsay, having conversation with them, they have appreciated all that we have done. I'd like to thank the students as well for um, coming out and being them and doing what they had to do as well and being thankful for everything that the school board has done and the administration. At our last graduation, I got a, we got a lot of accolades from the students saying thank you for allowing us to come back and to have graduations and do what we had to do. I like to think administration 
Thank you all for all the information that you've given us. Whenever I call, it was three times a day you were there. Um, I sent you several emails, you were there. Thank you and answering my question and all that I needed to get done. I just like to say ever since 2020, at the end of 2019, for me, it has always been about the students, always. And when we first started talking about closing schools, it sent a, it, it sent a chill, more than a chill down my back. And it actually gripped my heart because I thought about the closing of schools. Uh, it sent me in a tailspin because I thought about learning loss. I thought about those students at risk. And I thought about the students that we would probably lose because of this mandate. But because it was all about the students, I appreciate your, um, I compromised. You know, we got an executive order. We got the law 1303. And then you started presenting the data to us before his health was concerned and what was going to go on about it. I know that, you know, some have heard us talk about our personal service and they snickle about it. It's, it's fine. It's okay. It's easy to have a conversation about sitting in the back of the bus than it is harder to know you had to, I had to sit in the back of the bus because of the color of my skin. It's easy just to say we're sitting in the back of the bus and you take that as a, as a joke. It was no joke for me, nor was it for my grandparents, but I get back to this. Uh, it's not about the churches. It's not about targets. It's not about Walmart for me. I remember when the COVID first hit and they opened it Walmart early for people to come in. I literally wrote down a, a list and ran through Walmart because I didn't want to be in it, ran through it. It is still all, right now today, it is still all about the students, the teachers, the staff, and administrations coming out of the office to, to make sure that our students get, keep them in school five days a week. That was important. And we were struggling with that, you know, getting them back in school. And one of the things was if we put masks on them and get them in, that would be a way of getting them back in school five days a week. Yes, no doubt students struggle some with uh, virtual, but then there were some that did excellent with virtual. Had never been an a, a student, they virtually, they became a student. Some of them really, really good because, you know, we're looking at all, the whole picture, the bigger picture. Like I said, it has always been about the students and it's always been about the teachers. And I want the teachers to know that I truly, I truly uh, look at them as being a gift from God to be able to stand in front of my students and teach them and, and show them to be uh, examples. And this has been a hard two, almost three years for me as a school board member, having to listen to all the stories, having to, and whether you believe it or not, having to see babies going through the transition of having COVID, not being able to breathe. It's bad enough when you see a child with earache and you can't help them, but then to see them in a hospital and they're trying to breathe and there's nothing that you can do and you're watching them and the parents on the sideline crying. I mean, for some of us, that's, that's not like a fairy tale, but for me, it has really been a struggle. It really has. Um, I just like to take this time to say thank you again, and I do appreciate you. And the decision, whatever decision that we make tonight, it is for the greater good. It really is. It's for the greater good that we get back on track. Uh, Ms. Franklin asked one of the questions about the three feet, but my question to you would be, we talked about, um, getting the emails to the teachers about the students. My question is, uh, is school, Schoolology still in place for the parents to be able to connect with that and be able to get the information in that? Can they yeah. still use that? And number two, next question is, I had the parents to tell me that her child had to be quarantined um, because of COVID, but Child Protective Services called her and wanted to know why her child had been out of school and she was truancy. So are we correlating those things to make sure that that happens? Thank you. Okay, so I'll, I'll go back to your last question first in that we are coding students who are quarantined, mm -hmm. absent, excused, so that they are not truant from school. 
we're coding them as an excuse because they're quarantined. And the question before that, oh my goodness, I just forgot it. <laughs> it was just there. A schoolology. Schoology. Yes. Schoology. Schoology. Yes. So I would tell you what, David Den is amazing. So whatever solution we need to fix to find for the documentation, mm -hmm. David Den's probably already got four solutions that are one, one, two buttons and we're good. So yes, ma'am, we can find a way to get the documentation. I do appreciate you all um, making it accessible for the parents that had the smartphones or the phone, the phone that was coming in because after you all did that and we um, moved to that and made that accessible, got a lot of call from parents saying thank you because it worked for them because they all didn't have the accessibility to or access to a um, laptop or a computer. So I want to thank you for that. But yes, can we, can we utilize that as much as possible? Absolutely. Thank you. Okay, Mrs. Riggs. I wasn't going to speak because I didn't want to belabor this, but I think all of us need to, to weigh in on how we feel. And first and foremost, I want to thank every one of you teachers because I'm one of you and always have been. And it has always been for the health and welfare of our teachers and our students and all of our employees and to keep them in school, always. It has never been anything else, not anything political, because I, I live on both sides of that political world, whether you know that or not, people. You know it now because I'm going to say it. My whole family is both sides. More one side than the other. So I live it. I live it in my house. I live it every day. I get all of these things on my phone from my son and everyone else, just like from you. I listen to them. I read them all. And believe me, it keeps me unsure of what decision I need to make. And I respect everything that all of you guys say. I wish you would say it a little nicer sometimes, but I do respect it. And I read every one of your emails, every one of them. And I even go back when Mrs. Rye answers them to read them over again to see exactly how she answered it. And if I need to say more, you don't hear from me because usually she responds the way I need to. And that's why I don't respond. But I want to thank you all. And I have to reiterate what Ms. Melnick said. I've always been a rule follower. Always. Always, always. Believe it or not, even though I was the VBEA president, some people don't believe that, but I always followed the rules. And it's always been about my profession of education, always. Nothing less. I respect parents, and I respect your right. Matter of fact, my parents have been some of the most supportive people I have ever had in my 37 years of teaching. I never had problems with parents. I worked with them well. One of my parents became one of my best friends all my life because she was a parent of mine. But I want to say that this has been very difficult. I dreaded tonight like everyone else did. But I also respect our administration and I know where their hearts and their feelings are and I know exactly what they're doing in following the law. It's not because I don't consider or think any less of my teacher colleagues and friends. You are heroes. There's so many of you that have had to stay home sick. I know one particular friend of mine that FMLA and she has taught her class the entire time by another teacher in her school. She won't get paid for it because there was, there was a substitute in her class. But that's what you guys do because I know that's where your hearts are. And I love these children. If it wasn't for the children, we wouldn't be here. It's all about them. We all know it. That's the only reason I ran to be on this school board is to support the Virginia Beach City Public Schools that I grew up in 
went my whole life to school, graduated from it, and taught in it my whole life, except for two years. I want to continue doing the great work that Virginia Beach does. And that's why I ran to be on the school board, is to support it. Nothing less than that, or nothing more. It has nothing to do with Democrats and Republicans at all. So please hear me. It is the truth. All my colleagues know me, and they'll tell you that's right, because I go both ways. I vote both ways. Always have. It's not funny. But I am a rule follower, and I want to thank all of our teachers, no matter what we decide tonight. And I want to thank our administrators, because the people that have put so much work, blood, sweat, and tears, and time has been you guys. We're up here, but you guys have put the work in. There's no way I could have done what you guys have done, and thank you so much. I really, truly appreciate you. And I hope all of our parents do, too and all of our community, because we have a very good school system, one of the best, and it always will be. So thank you, everyone, for being here tonight, and thank you for sending your ideas, your feelings, your emails, and letting us know your feelings. Thank you. Okay. We have one final remark to be made, but I first want to make this announcement that we will be going into closed session of uh, the school board in, in Einstein Labs, so those present are free to remain in this room. So I wanted to say that ahead of time. All right, Mrs. Mellon. Um, Mrs. Lanetti, I have a question for you. So it's a terrible pos position that board members have been put in. It's terrible. Um, especially since the law expired in August. And we had, you know, the layered mitigation efforts in place. So um, my question is, what's before the Supreme Court or what's been presented to the Supreme Court right now? If there is an injunction, what does that mean? And if there's an injunction, and that halts everything, does that mean in a, it, let's just say in, th in three weeks we were at almost no positivity because we all have it right now or everybody's had it or whatever. Um, let's just say that in a couple of weeks we're down to almost nothing and we were, you know, going to start with high schoolers first who are mostly vaccinated and hey, the masks can come off now, high schoolers, will that also be halt will that be halted because of the injunction it will honestly depend on what the court decides and what the terms of the injunction is i believe the current petition is asking that the executive order not be enforced which would leave you in place with what the state law is you know that there's more to this discussion part of which i want to have with you in closed session but it will depend there and I will remind you there is a very good chance in the next couple of days you are going to see more lawsuits throughout the Commonwealth and all of those could have the same effect. So it will depend on what what rule comes down. So I could not tell you at this time what would happen. That, I'm just yeah, I'm just going back to what I've learned over the years and I've heard you say injunction plenty of times and if there's an injunction, you guys be careful because that stops everything. So. It, it may, depending on what the court says. And okay. an injunction motion depends on what you ask for and what you're able to prove. And is there a reason that um, the new superintendent of schools has not weighed in on this? I cannot answer that at this point. Okay. Mrs. Manning, uh, we were question. ready to has, read. To just close. a quick question. Has the um, Supreme Court even agreed to hear the case yet? My understanding as of an, about two hours ago was that the Attorney General's office was issuing a response to the court. I have not seen it. I've been monitoring the last uh, night, so okay. I don't know what it's in. Thank you. All right, Mrs. Melnick, would you please read the motion to go into closed session? 
I move that the school board recess into closed session in accordance with the exemptions to open meetings law set forth in Code of Virginia 2.2-3711 Part A, paragraphs 7 and 8 as amended. A7, consultation with legal counsel and briefings by staff members or consultants pertaining to actual or probable litigation where such consultation or briefing and open meeting would adversely affect the negotiating or litigating posture of the public body. For the purposes of this subdivision, probable litigation means litigation that has been specifically threatened or, or on which the public body or its legal counsel has a reasonable basis to believe will be commenced by or against a known party. Nothing in this subdivision shall be construed to permit the closure of a meeting merely because an attorney representing the public body is in attendance or is consulted on a matter. An A8, consultation with legal counsel employed or retained by a public body regarding specific legal matters requiring the provision of legal advice by such counsel. Nothing in this subdivision shall be construed to permit the closure of a meeting merely because an attorney representing the public body is in attendance or is consulted on a matter, namely to discuss pending or probable litigation matters and receive legal consultation regarding the compliance with Senate Bill 1303 and the Governor's Executive Order Number 2 and ramifications. A second. Mrs. Riggs, okay, all in favor, please show a raised hand. Madam Chair, we have a unanimous vote. The motion did pass. All right, so we'll proceed now into closed session. Okay, Madam Vice Chair. Whereas the school board of the city of Virginia Beach has convened a closed meeting on this date pursuant to an affirmative recorded vote and in accordance with the provisions of the Virginia Freedom of Information Act, whereas section 2.2-3712D of the Code of Virginia requires a certification by this school board that such closed meeting was conducted in conformity with Virginia law. Now therefore be it resolved that the school board of the city of Virginia Beach hereby certifies that to the best of each member's knowledge, one, only public business matters lawfully exempted from open meeting requirements by Virginia law were discussed in the closed meeting to which this certification applies, and two, only such public business matters as were identified in the motion by which the closed meeting was convened were heard, discussed, or considered. Motion to approve. Mrs. Anderson, a second. Mrs. Holtz, all in favor, show a raised hand. Madam Chair, we have a unanimous vote. The motion did pass. Okay. So, so that who seconded that? Who's Mrs. Holt? Holt. That leads us to uh, motions of by school board members to vote on any matters relevant to this meeting. Madam Chair. Yes. Can I help here for a second? Please. <clears throat> So the administration would be asking for a motion to approve our recommendation to pursue option C as outlined to the board this evening with the addition of um, an additional mitigation of uh, masks being worn at the nurse's office and also an additional layer where we would request parents who are going to um, have their children opt out of wearing masks pursuant to executive order two to make us aware of that and we'll provide the mechanism for doing that uh, over the next day or so i think so, those were it did i miss anything so uh, oh and so, that we would i'm sorry yeah well that was on the list wasn't it okay that will be um providing k95 masks um getting so, those available as quickly as possible for staff and students who require them so the chair is prepared to entertain a, a motion or any motion, Mrs. Uh, Anderson. Now uh, we, we need to make the motion. No, okay, Mrs. Me All right, so now Mrs. Williams, would you like to make the motion? Yes, I would. She just made it. I didn't make the motion. I'm sorry. Well, I had my hand raised the whole time, and I, to who, call whoever, and okay, I'll either okay. make the motion or I'll second it. All right. 
Dr. Spence shared how the motion would read, and so I was looking for a motion to be made by a colleague. Yes, so, I want to make the. I would love okay. to make the motion. Okay, I well, say so moved. I make no, the motion. I, I make the motion. Yeah. Dr. Spence can didn't make. He can't make the motion. One of us has to. Okay, so I please. make the motion to approve the administration's um, recommendation of C with the uh, amendments that Dr. Spence just um, announced. A second. Mrs. Anderson. All right. Any discussion? Mrs. Oh, Ms. Sowens. Well, I still have a lot of concerns about the amount of quarantining that's going to take place and how that's going to affect both our students and parents uh, who are going to be stuck dealing with that. Uh, I would request that we at least have the materials, the masking materials, available for our students and staff uh, prior to moving forward with that uh, option C as a condition of that. Um, and so I, I would propose a substitute motion that says everything that the superintendent's option C already has in place, but with the condition that we will have K9, KN95 uh, masks available for our students and staff knowing that we have students who are not eligible to be vaccinated. We have 1,300 pre-K students that we serve. So, uh, so, so we'll take a second to open this up for discussion. Mrs. Owens, before you go any further, do you want to clarify what you mean by having masks? Like is there a time period where they can't get them for a month? Or if there's not, does everybody have to have one before? Or are well, you going to allow the superintendent to make reasonable determinations when he has sufficient amount of K and 95 masks? Yeah, I think it's appropriate when the superintendent uh, makes the, the determination that he has reasonable amounts to offer them to staff and students who, who would like to use them. Is there a second? We, we need to have a second to open it up for discussion. So is there a second? I'm not sure what, whether she wants to hold off on this or ha, yeah, could you start. clarify? Yeah. Mm -hmm. hold off. Right, that we would start offering option C when we have mask, K, KN95 masks to offer our staff and students who would like to, to utilize those safer masks. I'm sorry, what? So again, I will. Okay, I'll make a second so I can say what I need to say to Mrs. Owen. Um, Dr. Robertson announced that it could take up to six weeks. Any other comments or questions to vote on the substitute, right. Mrs. Weems? Yes, um, Ms. Owens, I can't support that because it will take one to six weeks and we would have to order at least, and that's not even if we can get them, and we would have to order, I don't know, two or three or four per person per day because to follow the guidelines of if you touch it, they need to be replaced. And so I don't think it's realistic to wait six or however many weeks. And uh, my comment is it does remain a, can, Dr. Robertson, this will be a, <laughs> an administrative priority or Mr. Freeman as far as doing all we can to get these oh absolutely we're gonna we're gonna uh, order them regardless and uh, it's the quotes we got today were anywhere from 10 days checks in the mail you know how that works mm -hmm. to six weeks mm -hmm. and uh, the guidelines as we talked to our health department yesterday were that we, each teacher would get five masks to use for a month. They use one mask Monday. They have a Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday mask, and they can use it four times and still meet the specs on the mask. Now, of course, if the mask gets wet, then you can't use it. If the mask gets soiled, you can't use it. So we would have at least that number ordered. We would have plenty. Our first order we're looking at is 500,000. But so again, it, somewhere between 10 days and six weeks. And you're gonna order them tomorrow. And Mrs. Hughes? We could very possibly. So the question was, 
Will we order them tomorrow? Uh -huh. I can't guarantee that they're going to be ordered tomorrow, but we have all those. I just talked to our um, risk management uh, team earlier. I talked to our procurement team. It's in the process. We're close. There's many considerations. So there's some vendors that we know and we're confident with, and we know the responsiveness of that vendor. There are other unknown vendors. Um, so there's mm -hmm. factors to consider. We are gonna order them with all due speed as soon as we possibly can, but we have a little bit of work to do. Can't say when that is, but we'll definitely be able to update you Tuesday night uh, what the progress is. At the next school board meeting is what I mean by Tuesday night. Okay. All right. So it's Mrs. Hughes. Oh, we had called on me, then he came oh, up, so okay. I just waited. Um, I absolutely believe they're going to try to get them as quickly as they can. Mm -hmm. But again, 10 days to six weeks, and everybody's been in a grocery store lately and heard about supply chain stuff. This could be indefinite, regardless of what the intent is. And so we're, we could be voting on something that could never happen. And I just, I don't think, I, I don't think that, this is necessary. I think it's just another delay on something. And I do believe we'll be in violation come Monday if we just decide we're not going to do this until, you know, th this is one more milestone that we have to hit, like we've been doing ever since the beginning of this. So I would not be able to support this. Okay, Mrs. Anderson, and then we'll hopefully Ms. Owens, I, I respect your intent. <clears throat> Me too. And, I, and I, I wholeheartedly agree with your intent, but I can't support this because of the fact that I think it would it would look like we're just trying to delay 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 you know and I think we've come up with a compromise tonight <clears throat> and it all might be negated next week once we find out if the Supreme Court decides mm -hmm. that the executive order is not enforceable I mean we're going to be we're going to even though we're not going to be joining in, in this these lawsuits we're going to benefit from the fact that the judge is going to rule so I'm not going to support this, but but I do respect your your reason for it. Okay, are we we're, yes, ma'am. I will go ahead. Um, I will withdraw the. Uh, is that a thing? I can withdraw have to, that substitute mm -hmm. motion. Do we need to check With, on who seconded it? <laughs> but I will. I seconded it. The person who seconded it to I also. Second. Mm -hmm. <coughs> I seconded oh. it, so we could discuss. Oh. Okay, so that brings us back to the original motion. Uh -huh. I did. Yes. So that's the done deal. That's an, all we need to You're do to back withdraw. back to the motion that Mrs. Weems made. Right. So this is a final opportunity for any questions or short comments. <laughs> I hope Owens. that we'll be able to, to keep schools open with this decision. I hope that this decision isn't the decision that ends us up with not enough staff to continue. And I, However this plays out, this will be what the board decided. So I agree. I have great. Yeah, I hope it I hope it works. And I'm apologizing in advance for my vote to my to my oh. teacher friends. Thank you. So we are, so we are ready to vote on the motion uh, that was that is. Uh, yeah, Mrs. Option. Beams, just flip it. will you repeat your motion so they're clear on what they're voting on? Um, yes, to support the administration's recommendation of accepting um, option, option C. C with the amendments that Dr. Spence um, added. Um, All right. So, per, per discussion of the board. Mm -hmm. All right. Hearing. So final call before a vote. All right, then. All in favor uh, of the motion as presented by Mrs. Weems, kindly show a raised hand. Madam Chair, we have nine ayes. All opposed, kindly show a raised hand. And we have two nays with Ms. Owens and Ms. Holtz. The motion did pass. Thank you, Madam Clerk. And so now we, we just want to see what, and again, I just want to thank all my colleagues for the respectful uh, conversation and, and again, and so summary of any actions to be handled at a later date, just checking with the superintendent. 
Not at this time. We'll be prepared to provide an update on anything that we need to at the Tuesday board meeting. All right. Just wanted to clarify that. All right. With uh, safe travels home, everyone. And with that, this meeting is adjourned.